Good morning, Rami Romani here, your IFA guide, and we are in Luxor, Egypt, the ancient city of Thebes. This is the Queen Hatshepsut's temple. I'm gonna tell you a great story, and by the end of this workout, you'll know much more about the first woman that ever rules Egypt. Let's go. So right ahead of me, you'll see the Queen Hatshepsut's temple. It is the most glorious and most perfectly engineered and architected because it was sculpted, part of it was sculpted into the mountain. You gotta just take a look first, look at, look at this, the first thing, look at this. Look at the mountain, the balloons, the early morning in Luxor, and right in the heart of the mountain, you will see the temple sculpted in there. Queen Hatshepsut was a very special woman. She is the first woman that ruled Egypt, and it wasn't easy. Egypt at the time was very misogynistic. There's all kings and men were much more important than women at the time. I mean, hasn't changed much, but back at the time for a woman to rule Egypt, it was a big, big deal. And for her, she had to go through a lot to make that happen. Queen Hatshepsut is the daughter of a king, a wife of a king, a mother of a king. And that was partially the only way she herself could become what she called the female king of Egypt. She had a whole plan planned out from the beginning all the way to the end. But once she was the daughter of the king, she was the strongest, she was stronger than her brothers, her brothers that then ended up ruling after their father. She's the daughter of King Tutmosis the first, and then she married Tutmosis the second, who was her brother, who became the king. But it is known in history that Tutmosis the second, her brother, husband, king, was not the strongest king. He was, you know, he listened too much to his wife and um, he didn't have too much control over his kingdom, but it made her so strong and it made her find her way around all the decision making. And then the time came. that Moses II got weaker and weaker and passed away, leaving behind his son from a different woman, Tutmosis III. And that's when the struggle began. Queen Hatshepsut had her stepson, Tutmosis III, and she wanted to take the throne, but it is his turn. So she managed to strike a deal, and the deal was that she co-reigns with him. She co-reigns Egypt with him. And it wasn't too long before she sent him over. She said, I need you to be the strongest warrior. The king of Egypt needs to be strong. She sent him out to all the wars, hoping, I mean, you can never tell what she's actually hoping, but hoping that he's gonna get injured somehow. She sent him out on all these wars, and while he was out on one of the main battles, she took over. She decided to be the king of Egypt. And her plan? Well, she said, before I was born, the god of Egypt, god Emon, the strongest god of Egypt, came to my mother in her sleep and made love to her. And that's how I came. She claimed that she was the daughter of the god. It's what we call political propaganda. That made her good enough for the throne if she's the daughter of the god. And she took over. And she became the queen of Egypt. And she knew that the word queen didn't mean anything other than the wife of the king. So she decided, and I think this was the first time ever in history, to change her own pronouns. She became a he in every pronoun. In ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, the he or the him gets the, um, the sound F at the end of any word. 
and it looks like a snake. And in every word, everything she owns when she talks about herself as the king of Egypt, she gets that pronoun. She became the king of Egypt and you can see her depictions everywhere with a big beard showing that she is strong like a man to explain to them at the time. Strong like a man and she can be the ruler of the country. And that is a part of the reason why she had to build a building like this a magnificent structure that shows her power. This temple dates back to some 1500 BC, that's 3500 years ago, and it's still in this shape, but it was much more glorious when it first was erected. All along this area here, there were sphinxes flanking both sides of this avenue. Sphinxes of Hatshepsut's face on a lion's body representing how strong she was like a lion and how wise she is like a king. And then she decided to find the heart of the mountain and build her own temple in it. If you remember in Cairo, in the old kingdom, the pyramid builders didn't just build a pyramid, the pyramid was their tomb. Here, they chose their tombs in the Valley of the Kings, not in their own pyramids anymore, but they still had to build the rest of their complex, which is a funerary temple and a valley temple next to the Nile. This is her funerary temple. Every king in the New Kingdom, where Hatshepsut is, had to build his own funerary temple. This one, the most glorious of them all, is Hatshepsut. Look at this place. Wow. And this is just fabulous. Look around here. I want to show you this beautiful hypostyle hall and every single pillar has a depiction. If you look at this, you'll see every single pillar has a God giving Hatshepsut life and giving Hatshepsut all what she needs for the strength that she will get as the female king of Egypt. And then on that wall right there, there's a whole story. That's how, we, that's how we learn the story of how Hatshepsut believes she was born. She was born by the gods, from the gods. And that's what she wanted to tell the people. Look at this one here. This is one of the hieroglyphic inscriptions that I really, really like. This is called the Jet Pillar. Sometimes people look at it and think it's a power station, but this is the symbol of stability. And stability matters so much for Egyptians. And that's why in Hatshepsut's temple, to show power and to know that the Egyptians want her, there's so many of these symbols. The jet pillar. Now, the story didn't end there. Tutmosis III, her stepson, the one she sent out on all the wars and battles, to make sure he doesn't come back and, and need the throne. He didn't die. As a matter of fact, he became stronger. And he became of age. Tutmosis III became 21, 22. He's been fighting at all the wars. He became one of the best army generals. He knew his battles really well. And then, let me show you this first, look at that. This is God Horus. And it's the symbol of the king or the queen on, in the sky. Every king is known to once leaves this earth, dies, goes up to the sky, he becomes God Horus in the sky. So every place you go to will have a God Horus 
And look, look at that. Look at the detail in the depiction. That's the nail of Horus the bird holding the sun. So much power. This is the other side of the first level hypostyle hall. And you have to think, think about this place. Nothing else but impressive. You have to impress the people. Anyway, King Tutmosis III, I spoiled it by calling him a king and now you know what's going to happen next. But Tutmosis III, he was ready. He was ready to take back his throne. Some 15, 20 years into Hatshepsut's reign. He came back. He came back from all his battles and decided that he was going to take the throne back. He now is going to be the king of Egypt. And that was the point in history that Hatshepsut disappeared. King Tutmosis III became King Tutmosis III, her stepson, and Hatshepsut disappeared from history. No one knows what happened to her, but all we know is that he came back and she disappeared. Nevertheless, King Tutmosis III became one of the strongest kings of Egypt and he was an army general. So he invaded the most land. At his time, Egypt was the whitest in land. It had the most land there is. Tutmosis III is when he brought in so many horses from the battles. He brought in chicken, chicken. Chicken was introduced first time during that time in Egypt. He went and brought chicken from the Levantine area. We're about to go up the second level. Take a deep breath. This gets a little bit harder as it elevates up. Right in front of you, you will see multiple statues of God Eman. God Eman is the God that Hatshepsut claims that this God is her father. Now, we just entered a place called the Holy of the Holies. This area here is the place where the queen's body would end up in for the final prayers. Between every slit, there's also God Eman. This whole temple was dedicated for her father, the God. And whatever is left from those pillars, which are known to have been damaged on purpose, because specifically her stepson, King Tutmosis III, wanted to make sure that he wipes her memory away, that she never existed. He wanted to claim that he came right after his father and ruled this country. But there's another side story that took place that made them even more shameful. The architect of this beautiful temple, his name was Sinimut. Sinimut was Hatshepsut's architect but also he held another very important role. He was her lover. And we know that because of the relationship, of how much Sinimut was listed on the walls with her daughters, protecting them. And we know that from one more thing that I'm gonna tell you about right after we come out of this holy of all holies room. This is the room, the room that gains the most respect. Two gods, Eman, right next to each other, protecting and praying for his daughter, Queen Hatshepsut. One of the prettiest things that you could see in here is up in the sky. Look up. Right on top of you are depictions of stars and depictions of goddess Newt. Goddess Newt is the goddess of the sky and she protects all the kings and all the queens in their holy of all holies. She sits there side to side with the stars surrounding her and every morning she births the sun from her uterus into the world 
and the sun goes through the sunrise to sunset and in the evening she swallows the sun in her mouth and during that time the sun is inside her it's shining for the dead I call them the dead because that's how you would understand it now but in their world they call it immortality that is the life where they become immortals and that's the final spot for them before they become immortals and that's why Newt is always here for them once Sinemut, her lover and her architect did all his job and built this temple we knew about stories etched on the walls each now and then but one very important story was in a little tomb in the side of the mountain that was found we found etchings of Senemut and Hatshepsut making love and it wasn't them that etched it but some guy in her court decided to tell the world that both of them had a relationship and it was shameful and he drew their images on, their, on his tomb to tell the world later on, to tell us with his story that they both were in a relationship and right after this happened, right after the news went out Sinemut also disappeared Come out here and look ahead and enjoy this view. The sun rising on the east side of the Nile, shining on this side. It's very important that this temple, with all these statues staring out at the sun, it's very symbolic. These statues are calling the sun, these gods are calling the sun. Look at that god. They're calling the sun every morning and they are the symbol of eternity. The sun will shine again. I brought you out here to show you that most of this temple was once in ruins. This temple was destroyed on purpose. Most of it looked like this. Pieces of the temple with hieroglyphic inscriptions with the queen's name on them. Most of us was brought together so we can revive her history, we can revive her story. This is how they put it together. It was like, like, it was like Lego pieces and the whole temple was put together. Now the east side of the Nile on my right was extremely important because that's where the livings, living were. The Nile in ancient Egypt split Egypt into two. The side of the living and the side of the dead. This is the side of the dead. This is the side where all the funerary temples, where all the tombs would be. And the other side is where the temples that they would pray in in the morning like Karnak Temple and Luxor Temple and their palaces, that none of which exist of course because they didn't build them to last, they only built their immortality houses to last. But this is a funerary temple and that's why it's on the West Bank. Next to Queen Hatshepsut and the surrounding area was very very important. There are tombs all across, look up that mountain. There are tombs and holes in that mountain all the way through. You can see hole there, a hole there, a hole there. Every single hall of those are tombs. Tombs of noblemen, tombs of viziers, tombs of people that lived during Hatshepsut's time and none of them were extremely significant, none of them mattered so much in the ancient times but these tombs are actually the reason why we know about all the royal mummies at some point during ancient times tomb raiding really was excessive a lot of tomb raiders came in, stole the tombs, stole the mummies, destroyed things and the king at the time decided that he needs to save all his mummies, all his kings, all what they have because that mummy is their eternity. So he decided to go in the tombs, take all the mummies and bury them in one spot. Right there was the spot. So you have to imagine, we've been discovering tombs of ancient Egypt all across centuries here in the Valley of the Kings 
and never found any mummy in any of the tombs. Till one day, next to Queen Hatshepsut's temple, we find a cache that has every single royal mummy buried in there. That was a glorious, successful day for all archaeologists. But it means the king was successful in hiding his other kings and keeping them safe. Well, this was it. Thank you so much for joining me through the glorious story of Queen Hatshepsut and how she was able, with her strong will, to rule Egypt as the first female king of Egypt and build this glorious temple. Next, we're going to go get into the Valley of the Kings and maybe even enter the tomb of King Tut. So stick around and do more workouts with me. I'm Rami Romani, your iFit guide.